Ian Black coming to you today with a special live episode from the Mark Twain Library in Reading, Connecticut. The Mark Twain Library was founded in 1908 by Reading resident Mark Twain and relies on public support to continue its mission. These special episodes of How to Be Amazing are produced in conjunction with the Mark Twain Library. If you enjoy this program, please consider making a donation to the Mark Twain Library at marktwainlibrary.org. There is a kind of performer that I think about when I think about the word entertainer. I think about people like Judy Garland or Nathan Lane or maybe Maya Rudolph. These are entertainers or performers who can act and sing and be funny and who do all of those things so joyfully. And because they seem to feel joy, they bring all of us joy too. My guest today is somebody I would also put in the category of entertainer. Jane Lynch began her career as an improviser with Second City in Chicago and as a member of the Annoyance Theater Company. After years of paying the bills, doing commercials and with small parts in film and television, she first found fame in the Christopher Guest films, Best, uh, Best in Show and A Mighty Wind, but it was the iconic character of Sue Sylvester on the show Glee that won her an Emmy and launched her into the mainstream. Since then, she's appeared in dozens of roles on shows like The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Criminal Minds, Ralph Breaks the Internet, Julie and Julia, the new uh, Netflix show Space Force. Jane is also the host of Hollywood Game Night and when the world is not in a global pandemic, she is one half of the cabaret duo Two Lost Souls with Kate Flannery from The Office. And it is my pleasure to welcome Jane Lynch to How to Be Amazing. Hello, Jane. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. What a lovely um, intro. Thank you. It really was. I did a great job with that intro. So I'm wondering whether they have Emmy Emmys for intros to podcasts, but I would appreciate it if you would submit me if they do. Absolutely. And I I will someday introduce you as well. (laughs) (laughs) I I very much doubt it. (laughs) Uh, You grew up in Dalton, Illinois. You're the middle child in a family of three. Uh, What was life like as a young Lynch growing up in Dalton, Illinois? Um, It was... uh, it was a place you kind of, well, not being a Lynch, Lynch is, was nice, but it's kind of a place you wanted to get out of quickly. It was very flat and very boring. And um, once I started going into Chicago and you start to see the contrast, that's when I was like, oh my God. It, and also I wanted to be an actor and I knew I wasn't going to do it there. Um, it was, uh, I, this might just be retrospect, but it's kind of a flat, boring thing. The most exciting thing we did was uh, we were a member of St. Jude Church, which is the Catholic Church, and um, everybody was so much fun. My parents had great friends from the church, and they did plays called Port of Call, where they would go to each uh, classroom in the school, and they would do a different Port of Call, and they all got loaded, and they (laughs) chose until three or four in the morning. I was like, oh, I want this. This I like. This was a sanctioned church event where you just go and you get boozed up and you go from house to house. That that sounds great. Catholic thing, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, Port Hall was a pretty unique thing and it was a lot of fun. And the shows, as far as I remember, were really good. And everybody was, re- you know, having fun and singing and dancing and it was a blast. And that was your, did you feel like that was your introduction to the idea of showbiz? Absolutely. I remember once I was in the parking lot and, um, uh, the the cloakroom was like backstage and I was helping, I don't know, I was like bringing in ham sandwiches or something from my car in the parking lot because I was helping them. And it was about two in the morning and I felt, literally felt my body come, my the get, I was beside, literally beside myself. I was kind of watching myself and everything happening in like a deep, 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 deep bliss. It was a real like a spiritual experience going, I've, I've never been happier in my life than right now giving ham sandwiches to these, you know, neighbor ladies and fishnets. It's so funny that you interpreted that as, well, this is a sign that I should get into show business as opposed to a sign of I should devote myself to the church. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or I better go to bed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I knew. I mean, I was never happier. And I was, I just want to do this. I remember saying to myself, I want to do this forever and ever and ever. 
Have you, uh, I mean, now I'm just fascinated by the idea of an out-of-body experience. Have you, ha have you ever had one since then or, or was that the only one? Not a conscious one, but I have them in my sleep sometimes. Really? Yeah, where I'll shoot out of my body and, and um, I don't look back and see myself, which I've heard people say, but I see myself like fly out the door. I see myself fly around back in the, my backyard and I get excited and I dive and... <laughs> You astrally project. I guess I do. Yeah. Yeah. Not all the time, but when it starts to happen, it's so exciting. I, I vibrate. My literally, I feel like a plane taking off. I don't know if I'm actually vibrating, but when I was younger, it used to scare me. But it like starts like a plane. And then. Wow. Have you ever looked into that? Any, have you ever looked into that any deeper? Yeah, I, I, I have. Yeah. It, and I think it is astral. People would call it astral projecting. Um, I'm, I'm conscious during it. I used to not be, I used to wake up the next day and go, Oh my God, what happened? But now I'm right there. I, I feel it. And I can't control it. I really can't control even when I'm want to like go faster, go faster. I can't, but I was able to die. If I remember, I was able to like, uh, like eat, like you're diving into the water and that was fun and exhilarating. Hmm. Has that experience affected you in other ways? I mean, does it make you look at sort of your day-to-day -day life any differently? Or you just sort of accept it as this is just the th a thing that happens to me sometimes and it, and, and it has no bearing on my, my physics of the world? Right. I, I think it does. And I want to understand it. I think, um, you know, I think there's uh, more things on heaven and earth, Horatio, than we all, we all understand. And um, it makes me, so I am kind of into that. I, I go down the UFO um, uh, rabbit hole sometimes. I uh, I have been deep down that hole. Have you deep. Really? Lately, since like quarantine? Because I feel like a lot of No, no, no. But throughout my life, I've spent, I've devoted an inordinate amount of time to doing UFO research. Do you know this guy, Lazar? He's, he's a, he's, he used to work at Area yeah. 51 and they did a documentary on him. And he was on the Joe Rogan podcast and it's, freaking amazing what he says and what he went through and how the FBI is kind of after him. So yeah, I mean, I, I go down that, all that stuff. Oh, this conversation has already taken a detour that I was not anticipating in any way, shape or form. And I am delighted. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, not, uh, I've never done this before, but I'm going to plug, I'm speaking with Deepak Chopra next week and i'm going to ask him about this oh, yeah, uh, yeah. about astral projection and see what he knows about it because just from a scientific point of view i find it absolutely fascinating yeah i do too you know um i think uh you know it's, it's led me down many different paths but um one of the um uh most compelling paths that i've, I've found myself on is the advaita the hindu advaita the non-duality which is you know we're a person but our person is really based in in a, an energy that we all share, mm -hmm. a, a, a unity. And, um, you know, our, our bodies and our minds are just that. They're, they're thought forms and there's more space than there's actual substance. In fact, some say there's no substance. So why wouldn't some of this identity shoot off in the middle of the night? Why wouldn't it? It makes some sense. Honestly, I don't need to talk to Deepak at this point. <laughs> I feel like you've got it covered. <laughs> Whatever you're selling, I'm buying, sister. I am totally buying. Yeah. We're, reco we're recording this on Father's Day. Yes, uh, Father's Day. Oh, thank you. I, I wasn't. It was, I was not. I was not uh, fishing for a Happy Father's Day, but Happy Father's Day for everybody who uh, may be listening and or watching. But um, your dad, you write about in your memoir, Happy Accidents. He sounds like uh, the prototype for Jane Lynch. Can you uh, just share some remembrances of, of him on this day? Indeed, my, my dad, uh, and I'm more and more like him every day. He was a unique, charming, kind, loving individual. And it, oh, just such a, a really nice guy, really funny, uh, but in kind of cat skills. Like he'd say, Jane just flew here from California and boy are her eyes are <laughs> And he'd wait, <laughs> he'd wait. He'd wait for the, the laugh. Um, and he made up songs and he sang all day long. If something reminded him of a, a lyric in a song and I do the same thing all day long, he would make up songs. I do the same thing. Uh, I'm, I'm more and more like him every day. And also I'm, I'm more and more appreciative of, of him every day. He was a, a real 
he was a real mensch. And, you know, when uh, he passed away on June 11, 20, 2003, long time ago, but um, people that I, I don't hear from all year will text me on June 11th and say, I'm thinking of your dad today. Um, did he ever have any, I know he had a good singing voice. I know he seems like he was kind of a ham. Did he have any dreams of show business or that world for himself? No, he didn't, but he sure enjoyed it. He enjoyed this doing a, the, a little soft shoe and he had a really nice like Irish tenor and he could also sing like um, uh, 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 Bing Crosby. He did a terrific Bing Crosby and he had a terrific ear for harmony. And if I do say so myself, so do mm -hmm. I. That's, that's the one thing that I envy above all others is people who can sing and especially do harmony. That's what Kate and I do. Kate, I always say to Kate, um, after we did our first song together many years ago, when we were in Chicago. I stopped and said, you're as good as I am. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> ultimate compliment. It, is, it was, yes. Um, she's a really great harmonizer and she's a throwback and she has a relationship with her dad who's still alive. He's like in his mid nineties and he's such a great guy. And uh, we have basically the same background and the, the same talents. And um, she's a better singer though. Her, she has a voice like uh, a studio singer from the 1950s. She's outrageously talented. Um, so let's talk about that. Did you, you met her in Chicago? Was that at Second City? No, that was actually um, at the Annoyance Theater, but she had been at, at Second City at the same time, but we never crossed paths. Uh, but we did cross paths at the Annoyance Theater and we did the Real Live Brady Bunch together. And we started, when we moved out to Los Angeles, we started doing every once in a while, we did sketch comedy shows all the time with our group of friends. And she and I, every other show or so, we'd do a song together or, or we'd do, uh, the whole group would do uh, a, a, an encore of a musical number that we had no business doing. Um, as just, we were, most of us were terrible singers, but we'd do it very earnestly and, and wonderful. But Kate and I were, you know, kind of serious about it. And we were started doing kind of a, uh, a, a, a duet, Thing together at charities you know they'd say hey you want to come sing a song and then um when i, I did annie on broadway and at the studio 50 uh not studio 54 but 54 below which is the cabaret space in new york assumes that everybody who's on broadway has a a, a kind of a cabaret show and they say hey you want to do yours and i said let me get one <laughs> and um, I, i'd be happy to so i called kate and that was 2014 and we've been doing it ever since we have a five piece band for out of orange county here called the tony guerrero quintet and they're jazzy and they're kind of throwbacks from the late 50s early 60s and kate and i do songs like um andrew's sister songs uh we do some rat pack songs we say it's like the rat pack but with a couple of broads and you know good harmonies and lots of stuff that's what the rat pack needed was a couple of broads the broads mm -hmm. i'm glad i'm glad you're filling that niche yes <laughs> that's our that's our jam both of us including our, our band too is that era and that music we just yeah it's great um when you moved to chicago you must have been fairly young uh, yeah I went, well, I went to college and then i went to graduate school in upstate okay. new york went right to new york for one year but then back to chicago yeah i was probably but when i started working there in the theater it was um i was i think 27 so why did you go back to Chicago? You, you, you got a, a graduate degree, right, in theater? I did. Um, well, you know, nothing happened for me in New York. Um, I, I, I was very depressed, and I lived in a, probably five apartments in one year. You know how that is when you're kind of getting kicked out of places, and you have no money, and you have, you know, it was a hard, it was a hard year. So um, my mother said, come, come back, and I, and I thought it would be defeat, and it ended mm -hmm. up being the best thing in the world. I, I did uh, that uh, non-equity theater. We have a really strong uh, non-professional uh, theater uh, world in um, Chicago. And I ended up doing Shakespeare in the Park. Um, I, I, I was with a, a company of people where we did like stupid shows at uh, like cabaret shows at bars. And um, then I ended up in the touring company of Second City, toured all over the place. And uh, then when I uh, didn't get on one of the main stages, I started doing regular plays and I did four or five plays at Steppenwolf and then came out here with the Real Live Brady Bunch, which I, I did with uh, uh, um, Andy Richter and Kate Flannery and Jill Soloway and Faith Soloway were our producers. And uh, it was just as crazy, uh, the Brady Bunch on stage, the actual episodes. And we did it at the Village Voice or the Village Gate 
in uh, New York, and then we ended up here in LA. I remember that very well. It was like a real phenomenon in New York. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it was it was like it, it was like a a respected and funny uh, event that people were really paying a lot of attention to. Yeah, you were allowed to drink. You could smoke. It was right when the you know the Village Gate was front, kind of on its last legs and it was trying to stay alive. And they took our our silly little show in there. So you know they went from like Ella Fitzgerald and then Chet Baker to us. <laughs> <laughs> the natural progression, the way these things yeah. usually go. Makes perfect sense. Did you study at Second City? No, no, I just got into the touring company. The How training program? So was that improvisational or was that purely like written down and sketch based? The touring company was indeed sketch. We didn't do much improvise. We did a couple, you know, when you were going around the company, the country, you do some games, but for the most part, it's a set show and you're doing old second city tried and true um, uh, sketches. So it's a sketch show that you take on the road. And then if you're on one of the stages, the main stage ETC, uh, I think those are the only two they have right now you create your own show, but um, yeah, we did set stuff. So you did not have a background in improvisational comedy, um, but it sounds from what I've been able to piece together, like it was an improvisational skill that kind of made your career because you met Christopher Guest right. when he directed you in a Frosted Flakes commercial, which I looked up mm -hmm. because I thought to myself, what, what is a Christopher Guest Frosted Flakes commercial look like? And it turns out it's exactly like you would expect a Christopher <laughs> Guest directed. It's you and an actor, I don't know his name, standing outside uh, like Frosted Flakes headquarters. And it looks like you're sort of improvising in a Christopher Guest movie as you're watching for Tony the Tiger to come out. You were a fan of Christopher Guest at that time. Was it at all... Uh, intimidating to be on that set? And what was it like working with somebody who you'd really only been a fan of to that point? That was, a, it was a really big deal. Um, waiting for Guffman for me was like, uh, I don't know how to, as I was watching it, it was blowing my mind. And I was thinking this, I, I, I must work like this, but never for a moment thinking that I would be able to. Did you see it too? Did you, did you Oh, of course. Experience? I love Waiting for Guffman. Did yeah. you have an out-of-body experience at that time or you stayed yeah. in body and no, you were no, like, I'm- I kind of did. I, <laughs> I kind of did it. I was almost beside myself. It's where you're tingling and everything. And yeah. I remember I was sitting next to a guy who was on a date with another guy and it was a first date. He and I were cracking up and his date was not. And I was thinking, that's not gonna last. <laughs> uh, but I did, I had a bit of an uh, uh, out of body experience. And then uh, I was doing a bunch of commercials. I was auditioning, well, I wasn't doing a bunch, but I was auditioning almost every day. And I showed up for this audition and uh, I, I did the audition. It said nothing about Christopher Guest. Then I got called back and it said director Christopher, Christopher Guest. And I went, oh, and I walked back in and he was there. Wow. And a lot of the actors from Waiting for Gotham were there too, because it was a series of commercials. So they were all auditioning too. And um, I got it and, um, you know, it was, it was like Guffman, it was improvising. So it really was one of those preposterous dreams come true. And so then you ran into him at a, co at a coffee shop. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was having pancakes one morning and uh, after I'd done the commercial and he had said to me at lunch when we were doing the commercial, he said, you know, I do movies. And I was like, yeah, I'm <laughs> you know, I do movies. <laughs> yeah, you know, I do like, movies. yeah, I know, Chris, like, I, know. I know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and he said, um, he said, maybe we'll get to work together someday. And I was like, oh, that would be great. And then I was having my pancakes and he walked in and he looked at me and he went, and he walked over, he said, come to my office, I have an idea. So about four o'clock that afternoon, I went to his office and he was talking, you know, as if I had the part. So you'd be this, Jennifer Coolidge is your girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. And the only thing I have to do is talk to my co-writer, um, uh, Eugene Levy, and um, to okay this, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a call later on tomorrow. And he called me and I had the, the, I was going to Vancouver to shoot this thing. I was out of my mind. I can only imagine. Now I have been to many, many coffee shops in my day. <laughs> Never have I landed a movie role as the result of having pancakes at one. <laughs> no, I'm so glad I picked that, that place, the newsroom on uh, Robertson, thank God. I mean, did that feel at all kismity to you? Did it feel at all like faded? 
it did. And it was one of those things too, where I did say to myself, what, what if I had gone to the Earth Cafe instead? Because I went out for breakfast every morning. And, um, and then you just settle yourself down and, I, and say, you know, you, you would have met some other way. I, you know, I kind of, and this is an, an more of the spiritual stuff, the woo-woo stuff is, it, I'm more and more convinced oh, we don't have anything to do with anything. We almost, I almost don't believe in free will. I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like I can't take credit for anything. I, I, anytime I start to go, well, you know, I, I stuck with it for a long, well, no, I, I just had no choice. I, hmm. I, everything, I like getting those pancakes, I had no choice to do it there. I feel like I have a choice. I operate as if I have free will, but more and more, it just seems clear to me that we're just kind of being led. Yeah, it's the aliens, as you said. Oh, it, absolutely. It's the chip right up here. That, <laughs> that Bill Gates, Gates one. <laughs> from what I, I know. And they're going to put ads in there. It's going to yeah. be terrible. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. terrible. <laughs> You talked about, you just mentioned how you, you, you were um, auditioning for a lot of commercials every day. You were running around Hollywood. You were, you know, you were, you were doing what so many young actors do, which is just anything that you can. And in an interview, I saw you talking about how f- there's the cliche of the struggling artist and you rejected it. And you said that struggling is a choice. Can you expand on what you meant by that? Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed every moment of it, even though there was a part of me uh, going, oh God, will I ever get, uh, will I ever make money at this? Will I ever get famous? Most, that was, that would, that's kind of in the back. If you're doing it and you love it, and you know, I said yes to everything, just like you did too, and you got lucky that you, not lucky, but it just happened that you found these great people who you love to work with, that it really it worked, perfectly for you there was there's really no struggle in that I think that um I think we make things much harder on ourselves and we also have this this uh, societal thing that if you don't work for it if you don't sweat and you don't suffer it doesn't mean anything and um I don't think you have to I don't think you have to I don't think you have to struggle I think that is indeed a choice um uh, that you know uh like like this this um I guess it's easy to say for me because I, 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 I'm not suffering financially during this quarantine, but you know, I kind of just accepted it and, and uh, I know I don't get to work and I don't get to go out to lunch and um, uh, you know, and some other thing, you know, I can't see my family and, but you just kind of struggling is a choice. Um, at the same time though, you talk in your book, Happy Accidents, um, you were talking specifically about your struggles with alcohol, but you say that it related to uh, feelings of, and these are the words you, you quote, alien, alienation, self-contempt, and obsession. Mm-hmm. So where were those feelings coming from? And, and why do you think you were, how do you think you were able to overcome those and get to this place of acceptance? I think, you know, that I, that's how I was programmed, you know, <laughs> that's the chip. I think that's how I was wired was with those, you know. Uh, oh, sure. Well, you're Catholic. Yeah, of course. See? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my brother and sister, they didn't have those struggles. They huh. had, you know, different stuff. But I had um, the self-doubt, self-contempt, and the, um, and I, I'm still obsessive. I still have this obsessive thing I accepted about myself. I, I think about food 24-7. You know, I'm going to start tomorrow. I'm not going to eat that because because uh, if I eat that, then I can, and I'm negotiating with myself. And I just go, well, that's just kind of my programming. And the more you accept that that's your programming, the easier it becomes. But um, so that so you're saying that doesn't go away for you, but you can recognize it for what it is and kind of live above live, live above that chattering. Exactly. And there's like you get objective with it. You where you mm-hmm. to go, oh, well, that's that voice. And you don't you don't suffer over it. And, you know, I got to tell you, too, this sobriety thing. Um, I was sober about 25 years and then for three years, I took a hiatus and, and drank wine. And hmm. um, I, uh, it started out fine, <laughs> and then it got bad. And uh, my one, I, I was in a denial that shocks me with what I know and you know, uh, who I am and uh, how I, uh, you know, what, what I think about myself, I got fooled. That huh. he's fooled me again. So what was the choice then? What, I mean, you were, you'd obviously been sober for quite a while. And then, and then some of you, part of you was like, no, nah, I think I'll just have some wine. Yeah. 
and I, and I don't know much about AA, but I do know that there that there that, that that that's a trap that people fall into. Yeah. They think that they oh I can handle it. Yeah, exactly. After 25 years, I was thinking my body's complete. I've regenerated my cells seven times. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I'm a different person now. But the program is still there. I don't. I think we could change our programming. And so I, I uh, you know, praise Jesus. I had a, 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 a kind of I was I was struck sober the way I was the first time. It wasn't hard. It was like I woke up one day and it wasn't like I went today. I'm not going to drink. I woke up one day and I went. It's over. I just felt it was over, and I, it wasn't willpower. Hmm. It wasn't. Um, there was no. There was a moment I was listening to something and uh, uh, a guy giving a TED talk, and it, it it clicked something in my brain where I went. And it was about how this is my body, this is my programming, and this body can't drink. Oh, and, and, and I was done. Well, at least during those three years, you upgraded to wine because it sounds like you were on Miller Lite and yeah. NyQuil for the first, the first part of your year journey. Drunk. <laughs> Classy or drunk. And really, it was so interesting as I, because I, I, I was kind of conscious of this as it was happening. I became an aficionado of wine. And I would study it and I would go into the wine stores and trying to tell myself, this is all about, you know, it's the Epicurean delight of drinking <laughs> wine and not like if it were Boone's Farm, I would probably drink that too. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the obsession, the, that's the obsessiveness that you're talking yeah, exactly. about. And then you can fool yourself, you know, you, you know, exactly. That's the obsessiveness too, because I got into the minutia of wine and the particular grape. And I would go to um, uh, wine bars when I'd be working uh, like in New York, and I would stay at a hotel, and I would go down to the uh, bar, and I would talk to the bartender about the different grapes, and I'd get, leave there just absolutely smashed, but I tried these wonderful wines, you know. Was, was your behavior ever uh, unacceptable to you? I mean, were you, I mean, I can, I, I know what it's like to be drunk, but I don't, was it, were you able to like be a sort of societally acceptable drunk? Yeah, I was able to be societally acceptable, but um, I was, uh, we had uh, my, my partner who can take it or leave it. Um, we would have wine time together. And we'd, um, she said at one point, uh, she was laughing and said, uh, you're pontificating. <laughs> she said, you've said this, you've made the same point with uh, for the first time, seven times tonight. And I told like, I told the same story over and over and that kind of made me go, oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> um, what's life for you? Is life different for you uh, as a sober person than not? Well, you know, I, I've been sober for, I was sober 25 years and then I drank for three and it didn't change much except the obsession. I couldn't wait till five o'clock. So I, I, I've, um, uh, when I gave myself permission to drink, but it, it's been pretty much the same. I've been a sober person even though I had that three year hiatus for the last 30 years of my life. Yeah. Uh, getting back to like work and obsessiveness, you mentioned that you're a person who says yes to stuff. Yeah. Uh, you said yes to this for which I am eternally grateful. So thank you. Is there a fear of saying no? Do you worry about what would happen if you say no? I, I have that definitely have that programming in me, but I override it a lot. Uh, I, I used to say yes to everything and then go, oh my God, there were some things I just didn't want to do and I'd do them kicking and screaming and now I'm not afraid to say no. And, uh, you know, I really, I'll look at something first. Like I, I was a no brainer to say yes to talking to you. That was, uh, I was really honored to be asked. Um, but uh, yeah, I can say no now, but it was, it's, it's been a process because you, you know, one of the biggest fears I had was that the parade would pass me by that I should have said yes to that, oh my God. And if you know how you get invited to a party and you go, well, I got to go to the party. I was invited. Right. I, that's one thing I'm really good at saying no to is parties. Yeah, me too. Which is why, it may, might be why I've never been in a Christopher Guest film. Yeah. I'm just not, I'm not going <laughs> to the right. I tell you, the, the, the thing about like the whole kind of uh, culture of the Christopher Guest people is everybody's really kind of boring. Nobody parties, you know, just, I don't know how you, you guys were so young though, when you started doing your, your group. Yeah. State. And did you guys party hardy or 
A, a lot of them did. I didn't. I was. I was always sober. I was. I. Uh, I never drank. I never. Yeah. Like I just. I. I I had a kind of opposite thing where my obsessiveness was about being afraid of being out of control and, and worried that I worried that I did have the programming that if I, if I, if I started drinking, I would like it too much. Yeah. Uh, it turns out, I think as I've gotten older, I've learned, I don't have that at all. Yeah, like I, I, I will do things to excess. Um, but then I will, I will reach a point where, like you, like, like, like you had with that wine moment where I'm just, I'm like, okay, I'm done with that. Yeah. With, and, and you can do it before too much horrible things happen. I, yes. Yes. The thing that comes to mind is I play too much poker. Mm -hmm. Uh, but why is that like, bad? Is it because you pay, play for money? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I play for money, but yeah. be, because it can be obsessive because yes. like anything else you can get obsessed about it. Um, but I know for myself, like it's never affected me materially. Like, in, like I, it would, I would never lose enough money playing poker that it would hurt me because my pain threshold for losing money is far greater than my pleasure threshold for playing at playing poker. Well put, well put. I, I have that about money too. My, 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 well, how you what you just said. <laughs> when you didn't have money, uh, when you were st struggling, I know it wasn't a struggle, but when you're coming up, um, was that a source of worry for you? Was it a source of anxiety for you? How did you pay your bills? Um, you know, I, I, the minute I got to LA, I started working. If I wasn't doing a commercial or a voiceover, I was doing a guest spot and, and I, I wasn't rich, but I didn't worry about it. I didn't, I didn't, um, you know, I, I, any, any, any obsessions I had about money, I realized were my parents' obsession for me they were afraid for me and at some, one point i kind of left that behind like i realized that wasn't my fear it was theirs um and i, I did fine and I, I never feared to pay my rent I, I i went out to eat as much as i wanted to it wasn't a um it was it was you know and i'm grateful for this it's not a it's not a a, a big thing for me hmm. um do you think you talk about that year in, in New York where it was really hard and miserable? Um, do you think you would have been able to that you would have stuck it out in LA had the commercials not come or the little guest spots not come right away? No, I, I wouldn't. It would have been horrible, I think. But there's also something about New York, the energy of New York. Boy, if you're not working in New York and you feel alone in New York, it's a terrible place to be. Um, I think anybody's a ter any place, I guess, is a terrible place to be when you're that kind of conflicted and sad inside. But there's something about the sunshine here. <laughs> and um, I, I resonate differently here than I, than I do in New York, although I go to New York a lot and I love it when I'm there. I don't think I could live there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so that made it doubly hard. Uh, it, was a, it was really dark. And I was also uh, uh, just getting sober in a group of people who were still partying. And I felt outside of them to begin with. And I felt like an outsider with uh, these folks and um, it was very painful. It was, a, it was a very like existentially painful time. Well, let's talk about a happier time. Let's. Uh, go. I wanna talk for at least a little bit about Glee because it is such an iconic character and an iconic show. It ran for six years. Um, well, what's the, what was it like for you having kind of gone from gig to gig to gig to be on a long running television show? And more than that, to be on a show that really became a, a, a cultural touchstone. Yeah, it was great. Um, the, the greatest thing about it though, was we were um, given uh, three years, three seasons right off the bat. We, we didn't have to get renewed. We were given three for sure seasons. I had never had anything like that in my life. One of the things I always wanted in my earlier career was when I would be on a guest spot on a sitcom or a, on a, a, you know, a drama or something, I was like, oh, I admired so much those series regulars. I wanted to do that. I wanted to have a home, some place that, um, you know, uh, they were also, they were making great money and, and um, they had a place to come and they had a character that could grow or, or you know, at least have some kind of a, a, a trajectory, tra trajectory. And I wanted to do that. So it was a really wonderful thing. And then the um, the part I got to play, um, you know, Ian Brennan was he was basically writing all of my lines, and he created Sue Sylvester, and I had some of the most absurd, wonderful things to say. 
Um, I, I got to. You know, and horrible, horrible things that you well, got to. Just, just <laughs> and cruel and dark and, and mean and how anybody, uh, you know, allowed her to get away with any of this stuff. And yet she, she reigned supreme. Everybody let her do it. It was, it was just a, a, a real joy to play. Could Sue Sylvester exist on today's television landscape? I mean, when we're not talking about a show that is very old at all, but- it wouldn't uh, be, She wouldn't be ironic today. Right. She wouldn't make you go, oh, oh, because the same kind of stuff comes out of the mouth of the president. Right. You know, it's, it's um, she, he's, he's come to life. She's come to life in him. Hmm. Yeah. How did you find that- character and how did you make her I mean what did you bring to her that I think kept her grounded and kept her human oh I think she had just a big I think she was just tortured in high school that's what I figured and she was out for revenge and um so where do you go you go back to the scene of the crime high school and uh you know she was going to be she was going to make the C part in the hallway. She was going to have so much power that it will make up for the fact that she was so wounded when she was in high school. And then they gave me a Down syndrome sister. And I, I went, okay, there, there, there's the soft spot. You know how you always look for the Achilles heel of the person. So here's this girl that she has been protecting all her life, who's vulnerable. And, you know, one of the, you know, the girl who played my sister was so, so open hearted and and the character was so sweet and innocent. And, you know, you, she, I think Sue Sylvester put on her armor in order to protect this sister. And I think that's where her, her anger and her, um, the softness that's right behind the, um, the track suit. The softness that's right behind the track suit. <laughs> her armor, you know, it was like her uniform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was her uniform. That was, that was her, the, the, what she put on every day to go into battle at that high school. Exactly, exactly. They gave me an inner monologue once where I was um, uh, throwing shit all over the, the, in slow motion. I am Ajax. I reign supreme. Anyone who gets in my way, I take my sword of discernment and cut them down. You know, and it's in slow motion and I'm throwing kids into lockers and I'm picking up dumbbells and going, Argh! When I am, when I'm on sets now, uh, and I'm 48 years old, what I often find, and, and this has become increasingly true, is that I am often the oldest person on the set. Mm -hmm. uh, you must have been in your 40s, mid, around my age, uh, I guess. Age. A little yeah. older than you. I think I was 49. How was that being on a set that really was about like this group of young people? How did, how did you find your role just as an actress and just as a person on that set? And what was that like? Well, you know, I kind of see my, you know how we have like an internal age mm -hmm. that will be 80 years old and will still be, I see myself as like a 12 year old. <laughs> I, I have like the internals of a 12 year old who's always looking for mommy and daddy to um, think I'm adorable. And I'm not that, they're, they're kind of looking to me to be that way with them. And in the beginning, I was a little resentful. Uh, but <laughs> they're the little stars. But I figured it worked for Sue Sylvester too. I think that's why she didn't want to let those kids have too much joy and, and too much security because she never had it. Ah, yeah. so you were mean to them. You were mean to them off camera and on. <laughs> I was, I, you know, what's funny is I barely saw them. I, I barely did scenes with them. I was mostly with Matt Morrison, who was fantastic. Right. We had a great time. But they were um, great. They were really nice. They were nice young people. They were um, and continue to be nice young people. Um, really smart and and um, for the most part knew they were breathing rarefied air. Yeah. Uh, I won't even follow up. I'm not gonna. There's no reason for me to follow up on that because that would just be bitchy. I got no reason to do that. <laughs> I mean, if you want to name names, name names. But I'm not gonna ask. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you just you just said like. Um, you have the internals of a 12 year old and you're looking for like mommy and daddy to be like, you're so great, you're so great. And in an interview with Katie Snow, you said that you didn't have a dream job when you were talking about your career goals, but you knew how you wanted to feel. And you sort of jokingly, but maybe not said that part of that was adulation, <laughs> um, which I guess is sort of that same thing of mommy and daddy, look at me. Yeah. Um, once you had it, once you had that adulation and fame, yes. Did it turn out to be 
what you wanted. It, it was a bit of an anticlimax. <laughs> you know, um, it was a bit um, uh, like I'd be seeing it happening. And also I was, I was older. I was 49, almost 50. And it didn't have anywhere to land really. Um, uh, it, it, it didn't puff me up like I thought it would. Uh, it didn't make me feel sad, but it was just, it was kind of neutral. And I think that that's a sign of oh, some maturity um, that I didn't need, even though I have that and like, I'll catch the eye of someone going, you're fantastic. And I'll, oh, I'll light up, but it, it, it used to, <laughs> I used to, it used to hunger for that. And now I just go, oh, isn't that nice? You know? Yeah, one of the things that I've learned, and I obviously don't have your level of fame in any way, but one of the things that I've learned about that moment of somebody recognizing you is so often what I, the thing that I feel like I'm able to deal with in that moment is I feel like I'm able to just sort of take what they're saying and let it sort of reflect back at them and give them the gift of their joy back at them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, that's beautiful that you say that. And that's really great. I, I love that you do that. You know, I, I started to get that too. And um, uh, so in, interactions with, with fans become moments for them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, uh, you know, especially since there were so many kids like your daughter, Ruthie, who um, was so thrilled to meet me because I was a part of it, <laughs> and you know, and it's it's for it's for her, you know. You do see that, and I think that that's a sign which is nice because I give her nothing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can tell. Yes, yeah, she's really, really <laughs> hungry for affection. So I was happy to provide that a momentary elapse in in her. Uh, her it lack. was my Father's Day gift to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you are turning 60 this year. Um, do birthdays, big birthdays like that, do they hit you? Do they affect you? Uh, do they make you reflective? I don't know, they make me reflective. Um, in fact, I try not to be reflective because then I start counting the years that have gone by and how many could possibly be left, which might, could not be, you know, it could be less than 20 years, you don't know. Um, I, uh, I kind of prepare for the next year. Like I'll start thinking about the fact that I'm going to be 61 the July 15th, <laughs> which is uh, my birthday is on the 14th. Um, but I do, uh, for the last five or six years, my family who that lives in Chicago, we go out to Santa Barbara. We all meet in Santa Barbara and we stay at a, a you know, a hotel together. And, um, it's my birthday, a niece, a nephew, my sister, and, and somebody else. And we kind of celebrate it. So, uh, I, it's one of, it's one of many birthdays, but um, I always enjoyed my birthday because it's the middle of the summer and I love the summer. But yeah, 60 is a big deal, I guess. I, I, and then again, it's just a number two. <laughs> it's got to feel great uh, if, you're in, if you're in your family and everybody just got referred to uh, as you and your niece and your nephew and then somebody else. It's got to right. feel great to be the somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> there is, there's somebody else, yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to briefly talk about Space Force, which is the new comedy uh, with uh, Steve Carell and John Malkovich and Ben Schwartz and yourself. Um, and also, I guess, uh, mention like Julie, Julie and Julia. Um, just this thing of being Jane Lynch and kind of coming from a silly background, essentially. And then you find yourself working with Meryl Streep or John Malkovich or Christopher Guest or whomever. Um, do you ever, at this point in your career, do you feel like when you walk onto those sets that you have something to prove or are you able to kind of relax into all of those moments? Well, the, the, the Meryl Streep one I'll bring up, I was really nervous. Um, uh, you know, because the part I was playing, I was playing her sister, the, the Julia Child's sister, and they were very close. And one of the things that was really important to Nora Ephron, who was the director, was that they, we have this beautiful, loving, fun relationship. And so you, I'm basically meeting her right before action. And um, so I was, I, I was nervous, but you know, it's one of those things where you just have to settle yourself and just do your job. I, I worked real hard on it. I, I assumed she'd be making really big choices because she's playing Julia Child, who was a very effusive woman. 
and her sister was abusive too and they had a particular way of speaking which was almost um uh, uh like they went to what is the or, where you speak almost like you're british um <laughs> so like an eastern seaboard ac ac mm -hmm. accent although they, they were from pasadena california but they were educated where they had like voices like this so it could have really failed and been you know ungrounded and terrible and so I said, why don't you just ground it and just trust in your work? And so that was that was nervous. Uh, that was nerve wracking, but I was able to, um, you know, overcome it. I was able to stay stay centered. So you're saying there was no rehearsal period at all for that? It was just, <laughs> wow. Yeah, what's her, uh, and Nora had me come the day before and said, I want you to see the world that uh, Meryl is living with in this character. So I went to the set and I watched the monitor and I watched her do a scene, um, and I went, oh, okay, I see, I see what she's doing. And I, I was affirmed that what I was doing would fit in nicely, that mm -hmm. we were kind of in the same world and um, uh, that it would be, I, I was gonna be just fine. So it was kind of a relief. And I met her, hi, nice to meet you. Um, but uh, it, I, it was a, a, a relief for me that I felt more confident going in the next day. I'm glad that she had me come in the day before. Nora Ephron, obviously such a giant in the world of filmmaking and writing. Had you known her before? Uh, and what was it like working with her? I uh, met her at the opening of A Mighty Wind, the Christopher Guest movie, the folk music movie. She came to the premiere and, and we met in the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, she said, hey, another one of those, maybe we'll work together someday. And you go, yeah, that would be great. And then uh, she called me, called me at, at home and said, listen, I'm doing this movie and you're the tallest actress I know. <laughs> would, you like to, would you like to do it? And, and um, I said, yes, I would. And she said, well, meet me for breakfast. I was in New York. And she said, meet me for breakfast at my favorite little um, uh, diner on the Upper East Side, like 72nd Street in Columbus or something like that. And um, I did. And uh, it was kind of like the, the Christopher Guest thing. She was talking to me as if I had the role and how, uh, how great it was going to be for me because I'll have a free uh, trip to Paris to shoot all this stuff. And indeed, I did not go to Paris. I ended up uh, uh, the... Um, train station that we were going to shoot in Paris was had far too many Coca-Cola signs and stuff. So we shot it in Hoboken. So I got a free trip to Hoboken instead of Paris. Yes, that is for those of people not in show business, we usually substitute Hoboken for Paris. Exactly. Most movies that you see that take place in Paris are actually shot in Hoboken, New Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so from the sublime to the ridiculous, you are also the host of Hollywood Game Night. Indeed. What, what, like, what are the skills that you feel like you have to bring to that show, like as a host? Like, this is now your party that you're throwing every week, and you have to keep the the ship moving forward. Uh, was that a, was that? What, what what are the what are the specific challenges of exactly. of hosting a show like that? Exactly what you just said. It's like throwing a party, which I like to do. And I'm kind of like Jay Gatsby. I love to throw a party, then step back and watch it and not engage too much. I'm a little socially anxious. Uh, and I bet you are too. Like I'm I am. one, but I can't, I'm bad at parties mm -hmm. and I get a little crazy. And in fact, Sean Hayes, whose brainchild this was, he's exactly the same way. And one of the things that he would do is throw these game nights where he would create all the games and we'd go, we'd do it at his house and we'd travel through all of the rooms and play dip because he has a huge house because he's a big Hollywood star and, and playing um, uh, all of these different games and he made them up in each room. And so he decided to put it on the air and asked me to host it. And I said, yes. And that's what I love about it is uh, in the beginning, you know, where I'm meeting everybody before the show starts, that's the worst part for me. <laughs> that's the, so, hey, how you doing? Hey, good. And I always act a little overly cool. Hey, you know, <laughs> but then, <laughs> good to see you, man. And then, <laughs> and then the the, cam the lights go up and the cameras roll and I'm in my element. I love it. I love it. You know, I love um, everybody. Sh I'm so grateful for everybody who shows up. They show up ready to play their game. You know, they're, they're, it's like improv, you know, it's very yes and. You, you can't come and sit there on the couch and be afraid, which we've had a very few times. It, everybody's really into it. And then of course we have the civilian, the people who aren't celebrities and they, um, you know, it, it, they, it's a, the greatest equalizer game night is, you know, they're all just playing for one team. Yeah, I mean, it would be hard to show up there and and have any kind of attitude at all because you yeah. you know exactly what it is. I mean, you're there to have fun and to play silly games. Exactly, exactly. So you have to know that going in, and everybody does. 
Um, as we conclude How to Be Amazing, I end every episode the same way, which is with uh, the amazing five in which uh, I will ask you for a recommendation in each of five categories. Okay. Uh, before we get to that, I will quickly plug again that this special live episode of How to Be Amazing is brought to you by both The Dog Doc, uh, which is a documentary about a veterinarian uh, that you can see. And, and he, he um, developed essentially, let me, let me make sure I get this right. I'm going to speak to my off camera producer, like holistic medicine for animals, right? Yeah. Uh, and that is, and where can you see it? Let me just, let me, oh, okay. It's available on demand wherever you download your movies. That is the dog doc. And also this episode is produced in conjunction with the Mark Twain library founded by Mark Twain. Uh, and if you have enjoyed this and you want to make a donation, feel free uh, during this uh, global health crisis that we're in. Obviously all nonprofits need whatever help you can provide. Uh, MarkTwainLibrary.org Org. to the amazing five. Uh, you talked about food and the fact that you think about food obsessively a food that you would recommend? Oh, um, oh God, the Cubano sandwich, that fried sandwich with um, uh, ham and cheese and it's- Pickles, pickle, mustard. Pick, pickles is, yeah, and, and a little, I'm not a big mustard fan, but you gotta have a little. Um, pickles is my latest thing for a sandwich. I have pickles on everything. And it's just like in the last year or so, I mean, tuna salad, I have it on, uh, I have it in egg salad, which my partner is making me right now. Are you pregnant? <laughs> I know, I absolutely <laughs> no chance of that, my friend. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so pickles are my favorite thing these days. But yeah, that Cubano just smashed and fried. Oh. Uh, uh, specifically, can you, is it only dill pickles, sweet pickles, a combination? Sweet. I like always, sweet. Always and, sweet. Yeah, oh yeah, always sweet. And I also like uh, pickle relish. My father called it pickalilly. I don't know mm -hmm. if I made that up. There's a lot of things my dad used to say. I was like, is that a word? Pick a lily? Um, uh, I, I like sweet pick a lily on things too. So sweet, uh, sweet. I'm going to, I'm going to say uh, the Cubano is your recommendation, but the subset of the re recommendation, and I feel like the stronger recommendation is pickles. It's pickles. Yeah. Do you pickle, do you eat anything besides pickled cucumbers? Will you pick, do you, do you eat other pickled vegetables? No, no. In fact, I don't care for them. Like, I Interesting. Remember. Yeah, I, I, I kind of am turned off by that. They're usually cold <laughs> too, right? Yeah, yeah, usually. I don't like a cold vegetable. Huh. I don't go for that. There, that's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, about all all the stuff that we've talked about tonight, that's really the thing that seemed to upset you. Yeah, I don't like that at all. In fact, I want to let that go. <laughs> um, books. A book oh. that you would recommend. Um, let's see. I'm reading Eric Swalwell's book right now called Endgame. You know, it represented Eric Swalwell. And not personally, but I know who he is, sure. I know him personally, but I don't mean to brag. <laughs> um, kind of sounds like you're bragging. Yeah, I'm bragging. It's called Endgame, and it's really good. It's um, about the uh, impeachment and kind of getting into the weeds uh, about what went on there, which is, you know, feels like 105 years ago, but indeed it was only just months ago. Yeah, seven, six, seven months ago it concluded, right? Yeah. January. Yeah, let me think if there's something else that I've read. Um, that, uh, no, I haven't finished anything. I've started so many books in quarantine that I, I they just haven't grabbed me, but I, I'm really enjoying Endgame. It's a, it's a great read. As an obsessive, I'm surprised that you are able to put down books that you have started. You know, the problem is, and I don't know if you're old enough to have this, I can't read with my eyes anymore. So it hurts. Do you, have, how do you read if not with your eyes? Well, <laughs> I listen, audio books. Ah. I started doing some audio books. I'm about three quarters of the way through Hamilton, but it's taken me about a year, but I love uh, presidential biographies. I adore them. And I'm really enjoying it, obviously, though it's not obsessing me. My but, wife spent, I feel like a year and a half with, it's Ron Chernow's yeah, Hamilton. Yeah. And I don't think she finished it, but it was sitting on her, it's this thick. I mean, it's, it's a tome. It is a tome. It is a tome. It was very well written. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting, boy. The way they uh, uh, described, you know, Thomas Jefferson was kind of an asshole. <laughs> and kind of a, a, a narcissist and so john adams i mean you, i don't know you'll talk, talk to your wife about it they they these heroes of ours that we've kind of mythologized were you know kind of dicks well they were people and people can be dicks they can be um music 
music. What am I listening to these days? Uh, I listen to Chet Baker, and I love it. And I love um, uh, Stan Getz. I love that stuff. Astrid Gilber Gilberto, what's her name? Gilberto. Oh, yeah, yeah Gilberto. the Brazilian singer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Stan Getz and Chet Baker, both mentioned by name in Rough and Rowdy Ballads, which is Bob Dylan's new album, which I just started listening to. Oh, really? And it's so good. Is it? It's I've so good. Yeah. Okay. It's just heartbreaking and, and lovely and and but also but also not heartbreaking, like totally life affirming as well. I mean, it's just great. Yeah, cool. I've been listening uh, to John Prine a lot lately too. You know, he passed away, and I only knew a couple of his songs. And um, boy, was he something! Mm -hmm. I love his music. It's so playful and so deep, and you know, just really beautiful. Um, best chipmunk cheeks in rock and roll history, John Prine. He had these big <laughs> chipmunk cheeks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, a movie or television show that you would recommend? The, the Laurel Canyon doc that I'm reading. It's called Laurel, or like watching. Uh, it's called Laurel Canyon. Two episodes. It's on Epics, which you can get via Amazon. Fantastic. Really well done. Got a lot of the people who were there and used them only in uh, uh, in voiceover. So you're not seeing them today. You know, you're just kind of you stay in the world. You stay in the world of like 1966 through 1972. 73 it's and, it, fabulous. and it's about the music scene that that was yeah. happening like right where you live in laurel right canyon we are right now yeah uh you know mama Cass had a party uh every night and people would show up there and you know from the monkeys to um uh you know crosby stills nash and young and and um linda ronstadt carol king they would all show up and they'd play and they Joni mitchell would paint and oh just an amazing amazing uh time there's an anecdote I remember from that documentary where I think it was Brian Wilson had sand brought into like his living room and he put the piano down. Yeah. And somebody said like, it's crazy that you filled your living room with sand. And whoever he was living with, it was a woman, said something like, yeah, but he's writing such good music. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Laurel Canyon. And then finally, a potpourri and this is anything from your life, any like gadget or thought or just run of the mill everyday thing from your life that you would recommend to somebody else. Could be anything. Um, a frother from Nespresso, milk frother. How does a frother work? It's, it's this, little, uh, this little contraption and you pour your milk in there. And um, I actually put in a little honey and a little vanilla and you close it off and you, you turn it on and it, it frosts the milk and heats it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like foam, it's froth. And mm -hmm. It's really lovely. You throw it on top of your coffee and it's really delicious. Are you, uh, you had mentioned in previous interviews that you are a uh, caffeine-aholic. Are you still? Yep. I am, yeah. Yeah, that's my, uh, uh, that's, it's pretty much an obsession. And there's nothing sadder than like 10 o'clock in the morning and I've already had four cups and I can't <laughs> And I'm like, well, maybe in a couple of hours. Yeah, I'm, I'm an addict. Look, I mean, that at least I feel like you can you can manage pretty well. It's like Absolutely. caffeine. It's yeah, it's fine. fine. It's Absolutely. fine. Not killing me. It's, no. it's all good. Um, Jane Lynch, we started today with astral projection, uh, which I am so grateful for because I don't think I've ever met anybody who has astrally projected. To me, that is a subject of endless fascination. It's cool. And I would love to speak with you at some point about it more, um, you know, if we ever hang out. I'm basically inviting myself to hang out with you at some I point. I would love to I hang out with you. I, I have loved you for the longest time. I have been such a fan. And uh, when we started going back and forth with each other on Twitter, like we had a couple of funny moments. <laughs> oh, I, I ran to my partner, Jen. I go, look, look, Michael Ian Black laughed at my thing. And he, get, he like said something after my thing. Oh my God, that's so funny because when I met you, I, I feel like I met you in person once briefly. I feel like it was like at a film festival or something and our, our mutual friend, Ken Marino, yes, well, uh, yeah, probably introduced probably. us. And I felt sort of shy because I'm like, oh, he's introducing me to Jane Lynch and she obviously has no idea who I am. So uh, I'm just gonna say hello and, and be very kind. Uh, so thank you. That's really, really sweet of you. I've been a big fan of yours forever. It's great to sit down and have a conversation. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, again, if you've enjoyed this conversation, feel free to go to marktrainlibrary.org throw us a couple of bucks. Uh, the big man himself would appreciate it. 
And Jane Lynch, thank you for taking the time and thank you for being amazing. Thank you. All right. I mean, that's it. We're done. I'm going to say goodbye to you and thank goodbye you. to everybody who uh, was watching. This was really a great conversation. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Appreciate bye, it. Jane. Bye, bye. Bye, Michael. If I can figure out how to get out of here, I did. <laughs>